Hello and welcome to the PocketGamer.biz podcast, a podcast all about mobile games and the business around them and things. Uh, my name is Rick Cowley, I'm the editor of PocketGamer.biz and joining me as always are my wonderful staff writers Kaylee Parthleton Hello. and Matthew Ford. Hello. Good morning to you both. We usually record this in the afternoon, instead it's morning and so I am knackered but everybody's good. <laughs> is everybody good? Are we all alive, happy, doing well? I got that can, Friday feeling. Oh yeah, can can confirm alive. Yes, <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, doing okay with what you what you can, you know, in this today's world and everything. Indeed. But yes, yeah, yeah. it's uh, is is yeah. But the good thing is I have my green screen up, so that's something. Uh, we will be talking about a lot of things today. We will be discussing uh, Zynga buying Pete Games for one point eight billion dollars, which is mind-boggling some. Uh, Tim Sweeney's comments about the Epic Games Store, uh, Sega and Paramount have confirmed there's going to be a Sonic the Hedgehog movie sequel, um, Sega have revealed Game Gear Micro and much more. But we would just like to address something at the start of the show because obviously this is important and we can't really escape it. Um, the last week or more has been a really turbulent time in the world as uh, we've seen from the killing of George Floyd um, in Minneapolis, um, we we it, it's disturbing and upsetting that this continues to this day, and um, and we fully support the Black Lives Matter movement and everybody protesting against police violence and systemic racism. Um, and obviously, it's not going to go away overnight. It's not going to go away because a bunch of companies have donated x amount of money to x amount of organizations or anything like that it is on us to learn from this to go forwards and educate ourselves to diversify as an industry and talk to more people who don't look like us and all that kind of thing um we do have uh, a list of resources on pocketgamer.biz if there's anything you want to contribute to that please let us know um and if there's anything you can do to help we, we've listed some ways that you will you will find can be useful um even if the media in general seems to be moving away from the story, racism doesn't go away because we're not talking about it. It's still there and there's still stuff you can do. Um, so please do go check that out. Um, yeah. Uh, but now we'll move on to the regular show uh, and talking about games and people playing them and people making money off them. And one of the big things that we've seen this week, probably the biggest news of the past couple of weeks, Zynga has announced it is going to acquire Peak Games in a deal worth $1.8 billion. So to break that down, that's $900 million in cash and $900 million in common stock shares. And realistically speaking, that Zynga spending about $900 million or each on Toon Blast and Toy Blast, mm. uh, which it claims is going to add two more games to its forever franchise's list and increase its daily users by 60%. I mean, Kaylee, you covered the story. One point eight million dollars? Does that seem like too much? For two games? Yeah. <laughs> like when I was when I was writing it, I did think, wow, this is, this is just a bit insane. Yeah. Uh, that that's that is all I thought the whole time I was writing it. I just thought it was an absolute mental deal. One point eight billion. <laughs> I mean, I guess the you know, the, the thing to consider is is are these games going to bring 1.8 billion dollars worth of value to Zynga um, and that's that's a it's not going to do that overnight at all that's going to be at least like five years so it's definitely a long-term commitment to two games that I would argue haven't really been in the top lists for a while I don't know Matthew what are you what are your thoughts on on Toon Blast and Toy Blast yeah um you are correcting what you're saying it's got a long-term investment I think they've seen uh, the games do bring in a lot of money um Peak Games passed one billion um, in August last year. Um, that's for lifetime player spend across its entire portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, they've now spent one point eight billion to um, Zingaros to acquire uh, the full developer. So they're obviously seeing they're on their up. Um, there's they they obviously see, they think they can make the revenue back over time. Um, I think it makes sense for what Zynga have been going for recently, you know, after, you know, Small Giant Games was their recent, their previous course, acquisition. Yeah. So um, I think it, it goes, slots in quite nicely with their forever franchises. Um, also goes for a bit of a younger base, uh, audience base, you could argue. Um, both games are like match puzzlers. 
but they are very skewed to um, a much younger audience as opposed to, you know, a couple of the arguably ones, you know, you could be you know, 20 to 30, I could be any, everyone, but these ones are the much younger audience, I find, you know. So, um, mm-hmm. Be it's interesting, interesting you say that because I would usually argue that a match three puzzler of this kind would actually be mm. a, aimed at a sort of older female audience. Mm. Um, I know it's got the, the Toy Blast and Toon Blast sort of stylings, but actually I, I played Toon Blast for quite a while when it first came out. I got really into it. Um, and I was in, because the thing that's interesting about Toon Blast and Toon Blast is that they launched with, or Toon Blast at least, launched with clans pretty much straight off the bat. Mm. And you as part of like a clan would sort of Build, build points and you could donate lives between each other and there was no text chat or anything like that and it wasn't trading resources or anything like that it was just oh whoever's at the top of the, the clan gets can donate stuff to other people and as far as I could tell it was definitely a female audience who who was joining me in that I mean it's difficult to tell because it's anonymized and people are using their like fake names and stuff but it was definitely um, that kind of audience uh, which I think yeah. is, is actually more in line with what Zynga usually does in, in its um uh, oh, someone says Zynga game, words with friends and that kind of thing, and um, Wizard of Oz slots and that kind of thing. I think that's kind of their audience. In that way, it's kind of additive. But I, I, I see where you're coming from as well, isn't that, that it's it's a different kind of presentation. It's much more colourful and, and aimed at that kind of younger... Um... Yeah, I mean, you know more than me. I haven't played the game. I haven't played the game myself. <laughs> I've only obviously researched it, had a look at everything. I've, I basically, um, you know, I've looked at, I've had a look at the community and everything like that, and it's just a lot of comments I've seen surrounding people saying um this has been great to play play with my kids even you know it's a yeah you know, it's very colorful it's very you know that style so it probably is a bit of both to be honest you know um a, a female audience you know sharing it with kids that sort yeah, of thing so. absolutely um and yeah as you say it's interesting as well they just acquired recently acquired um small giant games um which is obviously a very very different game and they're kind of mm. diversifying their portfolio in that regard i think it's interesting as well because zynga Correct me if I'm wrong, but up until recently, they were kind of that they weren't seeing profits or particularly high profits. Am I am I right in that? I was out of the industry for a few years. <laughs> they they brought it back the last couple of years, I believe. Yeah, um, but they they did go for a bit of turbulent time. I think. So it's interesting that they 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 clearly found themselves. Um, yeah, uh, October twenty October twenty nineteen. I'm just looking at previous stories that we wrote. Um, they recorded their best quarterly revenue and bookings yeah. in their twelve year history. Um, which they attributed largely to acquiring small giant games in late 2018. So clearly they, they've, they've seen that they're doing something right and it's time to actually go out there and start buying even more developers, even if, if, if the cost is nearly $2 billion <laughs> for essentially two games. Yeah, I mean, mergers and acquisitions, it's, you know, it's a key way to success, isn't it, in this industry, especially revenue-wise. That's very true. It's very true. I wish there was a way I could segue into the next story off the back of that, but I just, it's, it's 10 a.m. and I can't think of anything. Um, Tim Sweeney, uh, voice of the people, has come out and <laughs> claimed that, um, well, actually, no, first of all, Tim Sweeney has said that he reckons that the Epic Game Store is still coming to mobile. So he's mentioned this, I think, a few times in the past. Um, in December 2018, he said he expressed interest in bringing it to a new retail platform. Then he started saying um, that he was going to bring it to Android and iOS at some point. He's, uh, GameSpot are doing a, a big event at the minute, and he's did an interview with them and said that he's still planning on bringing it to, well, the company is still planning on bringing it to Android um, and iOS. Uh, I mean, we have seen other storefronts land on Android, but I mean, Matthew, do you think Apple would even want to play ball on this one? Um, hard to say with Apple. Um, I'm not sure. Android definitely, you know, they're not supposed at all. Obviously, they've had history, um, mm. you know, with Fortnite and everything, not originally going on Google Play and everything like that. True. Um, I don't think they'd be fussed because I don't, I don't know what it's got to offer apart from like, you know being able to see your collection of games and purchasing that sort of thing. Um, I think it depends. We, we need to know more about it, I think. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it, we don't actually know what the Epic Games Store on mobile will look like. Will it be the full thing? I, I don't think so. Um, I think it's a wait and see. Yeah, I think the question is, like, are they actually going to be releasing any games through it on mobile and start acting as like a mobile publisher, or is it just mm. going to be like the Steam app, which is literally just you can see the Steam store? Um, and interact with it that way. I think that'll be an interesting thing to note. I mean, but if it did, 
if it like if it did manage to break through onto Android, there's no way, absolutely no way, I reckon, if the, if they were going to sell their own games, it would be allowed on iOS, because I'm fairly certain um, we've talked about this, and and uh, in the terms of service on on the App Store, you mm. cannot have your own App Store um, to download through the App Store. So you know the only way it could happen is through Android. Kaylee, do you think an uh, an Android Epic Game Store would make a huge difference to the world, or would we still see like Google Play? taking over and, and holding oh it. i don't think it'd make much of a difference i think it would still um android still be dominated by google play mm. even if epic were to do their own mobile games through their storefront because well google plays to go to that's been the android store for forever and um yeah i also i'm just going to say i don't think epic games will sell games through it i think it's going to be an app for um authentication security mm. and um things like that i think it's just gonna be like the steam app i don't think they're gonna sell games through it yeah the other thing to note is like fortnite's not actually you know now that it's being sold on android uh through google play begrudgingly to obviously epic um it's not actually done that great in its first month not not as high as expectations as uh, many people were expecting mm. um so you have to think about how much you know leverage they have on that platform then in that respect yeah that's that's a very good point um i had i haven't actually looked at the sales figures for fortnite in the past month um on android but yeah i think i oh, wasn't it they, they, it was the recent thing where they they surpassed a billion dollars in lifetime revenue and then you actually broke it down and, and the only figure that you could see for android was this tiny amount um because it had only just been released on google play that, yeah yeah, that, that, yeah that's right i haven't got the figures off the top of my head but yes yeah um but yeah, no, it's interesting the the thinking of that, and and if Tim Sweeney reckons he can persuade Apple to have um, a set another app store on the platform, then uh, fair dues to him. Um, but the other thing that Tim Sweeney has also been saying is that he believes that uh, making games free on the Epic Game Store, which is something they do, they really they give away a, a new game every week um, or two games or so every week. Um, he reckons that it actually leads to more sales for that for that developer. I don't know if so. His quote is. Something like, um, it's been a benefit for game developers. Most developers who launch their games for free on the store find that their sales on Steam and on console platforms actually increased after they went free of Epic because of increased awareness. Now, what I don't understand what he's saying here is, are people like downloading the game for free and then going and buying it elsewhere? Or are they downloading the game and then going and checking out the rest of the, the company's works? Yeah, it's because, a confusing statement. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, I think it's deliberately vague in, in saying this. I, I was wondering if it was he was speaking more of like the genres and everything. Like you, you buy a game. Um, I think so. He mentions is it satisfactory? Yeah. And it's, so if you buy that, you like that style of game. You then go out and buy a similar sort of game. Um, which again is a bit like I, I don't know if that works to some extent. Um, I, t t it, it seems very clutching at straws for me. Yeah, I guess I can kind of see the point though, because it's sort of if if it is like as you say, based on genre, when he's mentioning satisfactory, like there's no way in hell I would ever play satisfactory. It does not look like my kind of game. It's very detailed and and management based, and and all the like stats and stuff, and all the kind of stuff that really bores the hell out of me. Um, but I mean, if I did play it and liked it, then maybe yeah, I'd be more into other games. But also at the same time, I always think. Like personally, I don't play a game and then think, right, I love this genre now. Yeah. Um, certainly, I will. I will like go out and <clears throat> and maybe play some other games like it, or try and or ask people. Oh, I've, I've been really enjoying this. Is there anything like that that I might also enjoy? But I think it's playing one game doesn't mean that I'm going to instantly fall in love with everything else um, available to me. I, I don't know. I think. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I I do agree. Yeah. Um... I, I, and yeah, with Satisfactory, I think, you know, no, I do agree. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> don't know where I was going with that, but yes. Yeah, I think I, I've confused myself and everybody else. Yeah, he's confused us all, hasn't he, with that statement, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's move swiftly on, um, because we've got something that we can all talk about quite easily now. Oh. And we'll sl I'll slow down. My I realize I'm talking quite quickly. I'll slow down. Although maybe I should speed up because... Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, there we go. 
Yes, because <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog is getting a movie sequel. There was already Sonic the Hedgehog released this year on Valentine's Day. It was a very romantic day for me and my partner going and seeing that. <laughs> and uh, now Sega and Paramount have come back together and they said they are going to definitely do a sequel. Uh, Jeff Fowler, the original director, is returning. Josh Miller and Pat Casey will be script writers. Um, it looks like all, a, a lot of the people who were working on it before, executive producers that were working on it before, are all returning. Um, and that's probably because the last film made over $200 million globally in less than a month of release, um, which probably made its money back, if nothing else. Uh, and it's in Oscar contention. Are you kidding me? Yeah, because no other films have come out. <laughs> It's literally Sonic and like bad boys for life, I think. That's it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog wins best actor for Sonic the Hedgehog. Not even Ben Schwartz the voice. It's just Sonic the Hedgehog wins best actor. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, this seems like a good business decision, right, Kaylee? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that because I love the movie no matter how cheesy I thought it was. <laughs> it was very stupid. Yes. Uh, Shall we stop talking about business and just talk about Sonic the Hedgehog the movie instead? <laughs> oh, I could do that all day. <laughs> I saw it, so, screw it. I saw it in 4DX. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so, oh. like, so the seats went up and down and moved. There was, like, blasts of yeah. air in your face, blasts of water at the back of your neck, um, all that kind of thing. So when Sonic's, like, racing around, your, your seat, like, lifts up into the air and then f- thrusts forward and shakes mm. around and stuff when there's explosions. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very enjoyable film, but he doesn't actually do that much racing in it. He's in there oh. like a car for a, the majority of the film. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> it, it's, it seems a very deliberate choice on this, the writers to sort of go, oh yeah, Sonic's fast, but also he's not feeling too well yeah. because he's been tranquilized. So he has to sit in the car and move at human speed for most of the film. <laughs> um, I, th- I guess the good thing about this is that they have dealt with the redesign issue. Um, already because the first ever Sonic the Hedgehog look was horrific and I imagine they'll make some sort of joke about that in the sequel Um, they did actually make a joke to uh, Sonic yes in the in the first so yes I wouldn't go past them I lost it at Sonic I have to be honest and nobody (laughs) else in the cinema was laughing and I was just there (laughs) going off my nut it's very interesting to see how far it's come you know from the original design and obviously there was a massive uproar on social media about it and you know, it brought into the conversation of should you give in to fans' demands like this and everything? Yeah. Uh, is that the better thing? Is that the right choice and everything? I think for this, it has proven to be the right choice. Um, you know, it's pro- people have voted with their wallets, gone out and seen it. It has made um, a decent amount of money uh, for a video game film. I think it even beat Detective Pikachu in the end. So, yeah, um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so um, there we go. And it's getting a sequel, which isn't great. The sad side of it is I know the studio that... Dis- did the redesign of Sonic, the, uh, the character and everything in, in the movie, um, all got laid off. Oh. So, so, so with that, which is horrible, you know, you put in all that work and everything and to see that happen. Um, so you can't, it's, it's hard to not be a bit torn on it and everything. Um, mm. From a personal standpoint, I love Sonic. Um, Sonic is a hard time, he, you know, he does uh, across all mediums, he's got his good and bad, but um, the film was very enjoyable. I'm very much looking forward to a sequel. Um, but, you know, with these sort of things, it's hard to feel it's not a little tainted. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, if, if there's definitely money going into a budget to get mm. a second film off the ground, hopefully some of the, the people who have unfortunately been laid off um, will be able to find work either at studios who will now work on Sonic the Hedgehog um, or, or other um, visual effects studios. Um, I do remember they also did Cats. Um, uh. <laughs> which possibly may have played more into the, mm. their unfortunate demise because yeah. that film was a bomb. Um, that might that explain the first Amazon design Prime. of Sonic, though. The first design of Sonic to Cats, though. That, you could put that first design in the Cats film, I feel like, in many ways. <laughs> God. No, yeah. I, feel, I think it was the, the, the stu- it was the studio that did the redesign. So the first studio, okay. I don't think, worked on the redesign. And the, the, new, the new studio, I don't remember what they're called, um, worked on the redesign, but they were also working on Cats at the same time. Um, if you don't watch Cats, please do watch it. It's amazing. Um, preferably with a can of, of, of pre-mixed gin in your hand. Um, <laughs> on other Sega topics as well, something I really want to talk about because I'm really fascinated by this, um, is the return of the Game Gear. Um, Sega is now... So it's, it did its sort of micro... Uh, 
What the hell was that co- song console called? What's the Sega thing? <laughs> oh, I'm so tired. Mega Drive. The mini Mega oh, Drive. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's what I, that I was thought. Definitely. I thought you were thinking of like another spin off thing, like, you know, the Nintendo did the NAS Mini. Yeah. Like. Well, no. Well, the Mega, they did a Mega Drive Mini. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It was so, like a bargain bin in the end, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah. I thought it became like a bargain bin product in the end because oh. nobody was by picking them up. Oh, that's a shame because I heard no, it was I really like good. Mine. Oh, yeah, I got okay. one. Cool. <laughs> And a very excitable dog who's keen to, who yeah. also enjoyed the Mega Drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Monty loves the Mega Drive. He's a Sega fan. <laughs> Sega fans represent. So yeah, we've seen um, the NES Mini. We've seen the SNES Mini. We've seen uh, the the Mega Drive Mini. We've got Turbo Graphics 16 Micro Edition, and now we've got the Game Gear Micro. Now the Game Gear wasn't exactly the biggest console in the world, and given it's a handheld. Um, you know, the screen is fairly tiny. Now they've made it even smaller. And weirdly, they've also spread out the games across four different consoles. So you've got uh, different colored consoles all with four games each. And you're seeing games like, so one has Sonic the Hedgehog and a few others. Another one has Sonic and Tails, which I think was a Game Gear exclusive and a few others. Um, And then you've got one that's pretty much dedicated to Shining Force and one that's more dedicated to like hardcore RPGs like Megami Tensei, Gaiden, Last Bible Special. Um, runs on battery and can also be charged by USB. Uh, the display on the screen is 1.15 inches, which is just so Tiny. small. And a single <laughs> mono speaker. Um, and the weird thing is they cost $50 each. So to get the collection, you need to spend $200 or they have a special edition where you can get all of them for two hundred and fifty dollars, but yeah. you get a magnifying glass. Yeah, I, I didn't understand that whatsoever. Like, <laughs> we sell them for fifty dollars each. There's four. Okay, so the bundle's two hundred and fifty. Yeah, because uh, you because also you're throwing to, a magnifying glass. Yeah, you need to pay that extra fifty dollars so you can see what you're doing. I mean, yeah. does this seem like Matt? Does this seem like good business sense to be releasing all these things and fragmenting your own market as soon as the market begins? Ah, it's hard to say with this sort of thing. I mean, it's it, it's just how it's all come about. Because um, there was rumours for, I think, a couple of weeks saying, oh, Sega have a big announcement coming up. And uh, Famitsu, uh, the Japanese magazine, w- were saying, we've got a big exclusive uh, from Sega. It's, you know, keep your eyes open. And lots of speculation. People are like, oh, is the Xbox uh, Series X going to be rebranded the Sega Series X? And that's that, gonna was, be re- that was my favourite rumour. Yeah, of all and that's going to be released in... Um, <laughs> Japan under that, because um, obviously Xbox doesn't do great over there at the minute. Yeah. Um, and then for it to just come out and be Game Gear Micro, it was a bit like, okay, this was not what anybody expected. So I think maybe Sega let, let it get off hand a little bit. Um, how it will do? I think it'll do fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people like these little, little um, niche products and everything like that, and it's definitely a collector's item. Um, I don't think it's going to light the world on fire. Yeah, I think what you say about it being a collector's item is more interesting because it's definitely like that's go- that's going to be the thing, isn't it? Of like, oh, I own all four Game Gears. It's super mm. cool. Here, they're all lined up on my desk, kind of thing. That's going to be what sells it, I think. Because when you consider like even the the Mega Drive Mini had like twenty one games on it, and that was seventy quid. Mm. Um, so only about twenty pound twenty dollars more than than what a single one of these micro consoles would be, and with far more games on it. So it's it's interesting that that Sega have decided now to like break down how many games are on it. Unless it's just a case of like, because the console is so small, there's only so much memory they can fit on them, and that's that's the problem. Maybe they should have made like a, a Game Gear big instead of Game Gear Micro. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Kaylee, what are you? Does this interest you? And in, in, as as a consumer, is this something that you're thinking of buying when they come out? Uh, it's not for me personally but I do completely agree that they're going to be a collectible item. Mm. I think it's more targeted at Sega fanboys, people that love Sega, worship Sega, and they want a little bit from their retro days. That's um, I, that's what I think it's aimed at. Mm. But $250, though, for all four of them with a magnifying glass. <laughs> <laughs> I do want that's that the bit that glass. gets me. It's like 50 quid for this magnifying glass. <laughs> Am I the only one that thinks we've seen stuff like this before, though, in some sense, you know? Um, yeah. You know, there's been so many re-releases, like like retro consoles, everything like that. It, it just doesn't feel anything different. Like, as you say, we had the, uh, you know, we've had Sega's, um, what's it called, SNS, 
not the SNES Mini, that's the Nintendo Mega Drive Mini. Mega Drive Mini, thank you. I don't uh, know if it's the Mega Drive Mini, but it is a small yeah, Mega Drive. Yeah, similar thing to that, like, you know, PlayStation did all that. So we've seen so many yes, of these of in recent years. Um, it just doesn't feel anything different. Yeah, other than fragmenting it a bit. I guess maybe that's what they were trying to do, is, like, differentiate it from other consoles by going, mm. um, you know, take your pick of these four games, and they're sort of grouped by style rather than anything else. Um yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see if, if they if they actually perform quite well because I completely had forgotten about the PlayStation Mini until you just mentioned it then, mm. um, oh, and that God. that was just a nightmare, wasn't it? Because mm. it just completely bombed out. Yeah, uh, that was not good because of em- emulation issues and all that kind of thing. So it'll be interesting to see one if this mi- uh, micro mini whatever Game Gear Micro. There's yeah. just too many words for small <laughs> and not enough words for snow. Game Gear Micro if it actually sells well. And if people actually enjoy playing them, I'm sure um, our friends at pocketgamer.com will pick up at least one if they ever make it out to the West. Uh, we don't know if, if they will yet. They're currently a Jap- Japan only um, and will be the equivalent of $50 in yen uh, when they do release over there. So interesting to one to keep your eye on. Um, moving further from the East and more to, uh, well, to Finland, we're going to be looking at Rovio, who... Um, you may remember from a few episodes back, we were talking about their, uh, they had soft launched a, like a, a turn-based RPG type thing. And they'd done it. So they'd soft launch one game without the Angry Birds branding and one game that had all the Angry Birds branding, but it was the same game just to test whether Angry Birds still held its, its. Uh, yeah. I, Angry Birds Chronicles, Chronicles, I think it was. I think, yeah, that sounds. Oh, is it Legends? Like, Might be Angry Birds Legends. No, Angry Birds Legends is a different game, I think. Okay. There's a lot of Angry Birds games. There's too many Angry Birds Angry games. Birds. <laughs> well, we might not. We might see a different Angry Birds or a non-Angry Birds game. In they've just acquired Darkfire Games, uh, a company that is really difficult to find anything about um, beyond they've been acquired by Rovio. Because <laughs> just looking them up just comes up with a Fortnite Darkfire bundle. Um, so I've, I've really never heard of this company before. Um, but they apparently have been working on a soft launch game called uh, Darkfire Heroes, which looks very similar to the, the the Angry Birds Chronicles or Legends, whatever it's called, and Heroes of Chronicles or Legends or whatever it's called. Um, Rovio's CEO, Katy Leveranta, said that it strengthens our game genre mastery and expansion to mid-core games where we see attractive opportunities in RPGs. Uh, it's something they've experimented in before, and I think we've talked about that before, in that they, they've done this before with Angry Birds Evolution, I think it was called, which was kind of like, what if Angry Birds had um, were, were teenagers in the noughties and went full emo? Um, yeah. I don't know. Matthew, it, it, should Rovio be going into mid-core? Because... My gut feeling is no, it's not really worked for them in the past. But is this is this a better way of going into midcore is hiring somebody who knows how to do it or acquiring somebody? It seems a smarter way to do it. Um, I'm not sure if it's the best thing. I mean, the, the, Rovio loves to experiment. Um, and, you know, that's great. You know, that should always be applauded for. Um, you know, it, it's similar to what um, Marvel Studios, the, the gaming side of it, has been doing with uh, their products, you know. Um, you know, Disney and all of them, they went to Insomniac Games and found them for the Spider-Man game because they're like, look, th- these guys can create open world games, you know, similar to the Ratchet and Clank and everything. That's what we want for a Spider-Man game. Similar thing here, you know, um, Rovio are looking for a mid-core developer, someone who can, you know, make waves in that particular genre. And they, if they believe this is the right studio, then, you know, it's one of them things. We've just got to wait and see what they've released in the end. And if that's right, proof will be in the pudding. I guess, but the one th- so the one thing I, I always go back to is like they, they have just done casual so well. Like mm. when you look at like their top performing games, Angry Birds Two, very much a casual game, even if it's got you know long term retention mechanics and, and clans and, and that kind of thing. Um, Angry Birds Dream Blast, I think, is the other game they regularly mention as being like one of their best performings. Like that's what that's what Rovio is really good at. And maybe what Rovio should be doing is is expanding its its casual output and involving that rather than going right. We're going to go back into midcore because they've tried midcore so many times and it just doesn't seem to really work for them. I mean, I don't know, Kaylee. You know, we we talked to I think we spoke to you about before about Angry Birds doesn't really hold much sway in your mind, but you know, w- would you go for an Angry Birds midcore game if if given the choice? Would you play an Angry Birds casual game that was just another Angry Birds like the good old days, or would you sort of explore the Angry Birds universe with, um, in a different way, like like a turn-based RPG? Um, 
this is probably me being a bit biased because RPGs are actually my favorite genre across whatever platform. So I would be more inclined to try their experiment, mm -hmm. especially with um, having them had acquired Darkfire Games for our mobile RPG specialist. I would definitely be more inclined knowing that chances are their input's going to be in it and this is what they do. So I'd, I'd go with that over the old school Angry Birds, although I do enjoy them. I did used to love Angry Birds back in the day. They are stone cold classics even now. And yet I still can't find anything about Dark, <laughs> Dark Side games other than their game Darkfire Heroes, which as I say, looks a lot like, uh, well actually looking at it, it looks kind of like almost a, a clash game. So that kind of dropping enemy, dropping your units onto a thing and then they move forwards and, and start attacking, except with some uh, single player added into it, which that could actually be quite interesting. Um, and the other interesting thing is, for me at least, that um, it looked like uh, Wargaming was originally publishing this game. And Rovio clearly looked at that and gone, ooh, hang on a minute, we'll have that. So now Wargaming, it, Wargaming is still listed as like the publisher for now. So I don't know if Darkfire is going to still be published through Wargaming or if um, if Rovio has picked up the, the publishing rights as well. I assume that would be the case because it would be wild if they hadn't. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting looking game, interesting seeming acquisition. Um, not the only company that's been doing acquisitions this week either. Uh, Darkfire Games may have been last week. No, it is this week. Um, Playrix have also been back on their acquisition front they have decided to acquire uh i'm gonna get this wrong cat's ear games i think or katia or something like that c-a-t-e-i-a -E games um a croatian developer which is now being set up as playrix croatia with a new office in zagreb uh it's a team of 40 who i believe worked on a few casual games before now and they're now working on an unannounced free-to-play mobile title um Quote from co-founder Dejan Radic, we are one of the oldest studios in Croatia, so this is the start of a new and exciting era for our team, as well as a great opportunity for the local gaming scene to grow and prosper. I do think um, that, if I'm not mistaken, Katia Games have previously worked on a lot of PC titles um, before now being shifted over to mobile by this acquisition, and it looks like they've worked on a lot of sort of uh, point and click, I would sort of guess. Uh, kind of games based mostly on the art. I, I'll be honest, I'm looking this up as I talk. Uh, <laughs> oh, they did the Love Boat. Oh, okay. Um, so, <laughs> so interesting acquisition. Uh, I did have a question written down for this. Let me find it real sec. Um, is this a sign that Playrix is continuing to explore new genres? The answer to that is yes. But Kaylee, discuss. <laughs> um, I'll be totally honest. Um, this doesn't come as a surprise. I've never played anything by Playrex. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so for me, I don't know if I don't, I, I'll be honest of all the topics that we've got for today. This is probably my, <laughs> the one I had the most to say about is the one I said nothing about. <laughs> so, you want to go and do I my Sonic for a minute. So Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> No, mine, the one I knew the most about was the Epic Game Store, because I used to do the PC stuff. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, we're on Playrix now. Matthew, talk, so talk to us about this Playrix. One's for Matt. This one's definitely for Matt. I'll, yeah. I'll take this one then. <laughs> Thanks. Um, what was your question? I don't even remember. It's the end of the podcast now, isn't it? <laughs> we're all just winding down. Um, the acquisition. So, acquis the acquisition, is it a sign they're pushing out to different genres? I guess, yeah. the, I guess the, the bigger question is, um, I think it's again, it's it's another thing that Ro we were, I was saying about Rovio. Rovio are the masters of of casual games, and they keep pushing out to mid core. Playrix, yeah. I would argue, are the masters of like narrative match three games, and we've seen that in um, Gardenscapes and Homescapes, Homescapes, which have then spawned off a whole genre. Mm -hmm. um, and now they're exploring stuff like uh, hidden object games. Is this a good move for Playrix, um, or should they stick to what they know? Yeah, again, I think it's just the um, same thing which uh, Rovio are doing, experimenting with the market, trying to branch out from your normal, uh, you know, genre, everything like that. See if you can make even, you know, more waves in uh, different departments. You know, it's, it's always a good thing. Um, Katia Games, you said they're normally known for point click, point click games. Is that correct? As far as I can tell, yes. So With titles like um, Escape from Drug... No, Tales from the Dragon Mountain to colon the lair this is yeah 
So we, we don't actually know what sort of game they'll be working on. I mean, from that, you know, it could be anything like a hidden object game. They might just want to be expanding that sort of That's the word genre. I was looking for. I didn't mean point and click. I meant a hidden object. Sorry, oh, well, there you go then. You. Yes, they, 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 it looks like they're working on hidden object games and, and Playrix yeah. have just launched. There you go then. As, as Playrix are expanding into that genre, this makes even more sense to continue with that. Um, Playrix know what they're doing. Um, you know, they've, uh, they've surpassed 1.1 billion downloads recently. Yep. Um, Gardenscapes has been a big, huge success and big part of that. And Gar- uh, Homescapes too. Um, it just seems a smart move, you know, bringing a developer that's maybe not that well known, bringing them into the fold. They've clearly seen something there and um, they're going to put it under their banner. And then hopefully, you know, difference between re- releasing something associated with player rigs and something underneath Katia Games, who we've never heard of, it's obviously going to get a boost. Mm. I mean, Katia Games isn't like an unknown force or anything like that. As I said, no, they made, no, no. They made but in the mobile like, market, especially Playrix is a force. Yeah, no, true. Um, and yeah, I think it's interesting. I guess the thing that Playrix uh, are good at and probably best known for is this: is the whole narrative addition to to um, existing genres. So it'd be interesting to see if the Playrix formula of kind of sticking a story into a traditionally storyless game. Mm. is going to work in different genres. I mean, a hidden object game, they typically do have good stories, and we've seen games like um, June's Journey from Wooga have, have got a lot of... They, they've continually updated with new episodes each week and all that kind of thing, so we've seen that that can work. it would be interesting to see if the Playrix approach, which kind of intertwines narrative and, and um, base building almost, um, is going to work as well. Yeah, I mean, they, they uh, released Mana Matters recently, yeah. Playrix. Um, that was the hidden object game, and I played a, a, a few hours of that and everything. And, you know, they are fun, they are addictive, um, so I can definitely see how they can take off, and, that, you know, it does seem to be early estimations. It's doing okay, so I, I imagine with this, they'll just continue to go on as they have been, and we, we shall see in the future. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting that Playrix have done recently is they have soft launched a new match three puzzle RPG called Puzzle Breakers. So this looks to be um, pretty much kind of a, a fair, fairly similar to what they would usually do in that it involves matching colored gems. Uh, the only difference this time around is that it's more like uh, previously mentioned small giant games, I think Empire and Puzzles or whatever it's called, um, with the, the that kind of match three RPG genre where you match stuff and then um, it attacks an enemy and that kind of thing, um, which I think is really interesting as well, because as I say, if Playrix is going to add its own narrative spin on that, maybe that could be a new big thing. I, I don't know, Matthew, I'm going to go back to you on this because you're our soft launch expert. I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you make of, of Puzzle Breakers? Do you think it's an interesting looking game from what you've seen? It's a little different from what we've seen. Um, I don't know if it's it's always hard to tell them soft launch. Um, the game's changed so much over time, you know, um this has just been soft launched um recently so who knows it might not come out for six months it might not come out for a year it might not come out for two years it might not come out at all yeah. that's the thing with soft launch um you know it's got a generic arc as it's like poster boy at the minute mm. it doesn't stand out to me anything different uh gameplay as well it's just a bit knights and orcs and you know monster sort of thing um it's just experimenting at the minute i think it's the RPG elements, if they can find something different with that, or even just, you know, work on something that's been established before and make it fun, I'm sure they can find an audience. I think, yeah, the, other, the it's an interesting thing as well, because as we were saying, it, it feels more of a mid-core game. It has that sort of casual play, but it's definitely, mm. um, if you're going to be upgrading stuff and, and, and leveling up and that kind of thing, it's, it's again, another casual company sort of pushing into mid-core. And maybe, maybe we're about to see the return of mid-core. You know, the one thing we, we, I think we can all agree on is that Hyper Casual has been enormous lately and there's been a huge push towards developers returning to that super simple game. But now we're seeing like the developers of traditionally simple games again returning to, well, what if we can make them deeper and what if we make a more, um, you know, that, that mid-tier experience between hardcore and casual at mid-core as it is called. Um, I think that that's the more fascinating thing is that we're seeing like this general sort of trend of developers experimenting again in midcore, um, which was a huge thing back when I started in like 2015, 2016, and then seemed to to die down, and, and the, the hardcore ca- games carried on, and now and the, everyone else went back to casual. Um, maybe now is the time. I don't know, Kaylee. What what are your thoughts on, on the midcore markets in general? 
Um, I actually, I think it's, I think it is going to make more of a comeback. Mm -hmm. I definitely think it will. Because um, people like me, I like things that are a bit more in depth. I think that's part of, I like some hyper casual games, but part of my issue is I do like to go a bit deeper and that is what Midcore offers. And I do think that's been missing. And I think um, with some of the companies now clearly leaning more towards it, I do think the market's gonna, gonna come back up again for Midcore and I think it will be received quite well. Matthew, you seem to be chewing your lip. Am I? Oh, possibly I didn't even think, notice. Possibly thinking of a response. I, w- I didn't know I was, but uh, no, I was just thinking, uh, yeah, n- no, I just, yeah, I agree with what Kaylee's saying. Um, it does seem like it's going to be a, making a bit of a comeback. I mean, the main thing here, what I take away is Playrix are making a lot of big moves at the minute. Um, and I think it, it's going to be showing over the next year or so. Indeed. Uh, only time will tell, because as you say, these games might not even come out. Uh, and uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where, where, where it all goes and, and who comes out on top. Um, I think that's going to do it for us. I think we've reached a good stopping point there. We've talked about a lot of the big things and the big moments of the week. So yeah, let's let's call it there. That's that'll be the end of our of our weekly podcast. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, there will probably not be a podcast next week because we will all be at Pocket Game Connects Digital number two, which is going to take up a lot of our time and hopefully take up a lot of your time as well. If you haven't got a ticket, they are still available. You will still be able to buy tickets during the week as well. If there's any days you particularly want to go to, um, you know, you can just join in midweek and join and get, get access to our new meeting system. We've got new channels to talk to people and interact with everybody. We've completely revamped a lot of it, um, but same great content, same great stuff. All of us will be there as well, hosting panels and uh, round table sessions at the end of the week and fireside chats and all sorts of stuff. So if you're not sick of seeing our faces yet, uh, come check us out. Uh, it's going to be great. And as I say, if you've not got a ticket, please do go get one. It's, it's worth going to. Um, if you are a job seeker, we are also offering free tickets to people who are currently trying to, to get jobs in the industry because um, we know a lot of people are, are struggling with jobs at the minute due to, to the ongoing pandemic and that kind of thing. Um, so there'll be information on, about that on pocketgamer.biz as well. So go check that out and um, do check out pocketgamer.biz for all the news that we've talked about and upcoming news and all your business needs for the mobile industry. Uh, I think that is everything. So it leaves me to say goodbye to Matthew. Goodbye. Goodbye to Kaylee. Bye. And goodbye to you all. Thank you again for joining us and we will see you all in the near future. Bye-bye.